Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to welcome you to our final sign-off for the uh, burn. And we thought we would invite you today because we have completed the process of burning the ivory. And we wanted you to come and actually feel some of the ivory ash and to view it so that you can tell your viewers that this is what burnt ivory looks like or ivory which has disintegrated. This is how it looks. And we have our chairman here, uh, Dr. Leakey, who's going to say a few words and then we'll open it up for a few questions. So, Dr. Leakey, over to you. Well, thank you all very much. Before I uh, go into the few comments I wanted to make, let me just say the outreach of your efforts reporting on our efforts was phenomenal. Um, the event last Saturday, I believe, reached every corner of this globe. Um, and it was accurately reported, well reported. And we have had an incredible response from everybody everywhere. So hats off to the media. Um, and I don't often hear people say hats off to the media, but my hat is right off. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, the second thing I wanted to say is that um, last Saturday we were expecting a lot of rain. I promised our president it wouldn't rain. It didn't. And when we arrived here this morning, I said to the DG, it's going to rain. He said, well, if it does, it doesn't matter. But why don't you stop it? Well, there's no rain. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me for a third opportunity uh, to talk to the rain gods because um, it probably won't work three times so quite seriously um, I was surprised we were having another press conference uh, but then uh, the DG told me that there's still a, an element of questioning as to the wisdom of what we did and the authenticity of what we did maybe it wasn't ivory we burned. Maybe there's some funny business going on. It was ivory. It has been burnt. It was destroyed 105 tons. And there's absolutely no fragment larger than these two on the table, which if you could sell to the ivory market, I salute you. It's finished. So I think I want to emphasize the integrity of the exercise. Every tusk, as you know, was, was um, entered into a very detailed computerized inventory coming in and coming out, um, and there's no question of that being the issue. The other comment I wanted to raise is that I'm being told that there are still experts, conservationists and economists who say, doesn't KWS, and they mean me in this instance, know that if you deplete the stock of a commodity, you push the price up. Let me just remind everybody once again, and I understand that you don't often believe what I say, but you can check this one. In 1990, when we burned the ivory, we had exactly word for word the same comments, probably by some of the same people, certainly the Kenyan-based conservation economist commented at that time in those words. He said, you're working contrary to economic theory. This will push the price up. And I said, I don't believe it will, because what we're working on is a market that is sentimental. And I believe if we can uh, shame people about ivory, and if we can get the international legislation behind us, the price will come crashing down. You can go to CITES, you can go to traffic, the, 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 the people who police this, you can get details from, from Mr. Mundy, from Winnie. Within six months of the last burn, within the time that CITES declared a total ban on ivory, the price of ivory collapsed. And it went from $300 a kilo, which we knew was the price in Kenya, to less than 10 a kilo six months later. And it remained less than 10 for between 10 and 15 years. You don't have to take my word for it. That's documented across Africa. Then 
South Africa and a group of their pals, other states, persuaded the membership of CITES, the government of CITES, to let them have a one-off sale of stockpiles. And I don't know what the tonnage was, but quite a lot of ivory went back onto the market, specifically sold to China, I, I believe. Japan first, then China. Japan, Japan. China. Within months, and I assure you months, the price started to soar. And within five years, the price was back almost to where it had been when we, when we burnt it. Today, ivory is in Kenya between $500 and $750 to, to, to the person in the streets of Nairobi, I think. When you get over to China, it's closer to $2,000 a kilo. I am quite sure if we succeed with the discussions in CITES in September of this year and get a complete majority to support Kenya's resolution that ivory will no longer be sold because it's all on Appendix 1, I bet you, and these wonderful economists who are back to front on their theories about wild species, I bet you the price comes right down again. If it comes down, and if we can keep the ban in place, why would anyone kill elephants? The only reason they'll kill elephants is if there's domestic trade. That's a much harder one to persuade people to ban until the stocks run low. I think the domestic prices of domestically traded ivory in a country that is banned internationally may rise, but the international price of ivory will come down, I believe. I don't like to be wrong, and I know that because I have been wrong before, but on this one, I challenge the world to see if I'm wrong on this one. I think it's the right thing to have done, and we do it partly to drive the price down and collapse the market, but partly at a slightly different level of discussion. And I ask the world, can we, in the 21st century, really morally and ethically justify killing wild species that are endangered for trophies, such as the ivory that goes into the market? Have we not reached the stage in our civilization where all of us should be shamed by the conscious, regulated destruction of wild species? It's time to end it. And I think we've got to sh make the use of ivory in any sense, other than old pianos perhaps and billiard balls. But let us curse people who continue to stockpile and use ivory. It's not necessary. Let us move beyond where we are now and let us project to the end of the 21st century when wild species should be completely safe. That's my second reason for supporting the decision of His Excellency, our President, to burn this ivory once and for all. That's why we did it. Two messages, bring the market down and bring public attraction to ivory down too. I don't think there's anything else you want me to talk about? No, that's good. And I'll take any questions that some of you want, but I'm hoping for the rain now. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that China can be part of, the, part of the solution? And if so, why? Well, I think if, if as many um, conservationists and economists say that China is, is, is the biggest part of the market, the only way the market is going to be influenced is by the Chinese. Um, and so we need to look at the, Ch at the Chinese nation, Chinese people, not as adversaries, <coughs> but as colleagues in trying to save something very important. China isn't listed as a superpower, but it probably is as close as you could get without being so listed. And the people of China, surely we know them, are smart people. And they don't want to be a superpower that's spat at because of the ivory trade. I think they will find a way to do just what the rest of us are doing. I also believe that China is very sincere in its wish to trade with African nations. I'm not going into the motives because all trade has other motives. 
But if Africa gets behind the ban on ivory sales across international frontiers, China will be responsive, in my view. And therefore, I said to you earlier at another meeting, and I've said to some of you before, China must be seen as part of the solution, not as the problem. There was an argument that for ivory of such magnitude to get completely destroyed, it had to burn over a much longer period of time. This one seems to have burned uh, a bit faster. Well, uh, uh, are you talking about three days or are you talking about one go in instead of ten years? <laughs> three days. How many days? Three days. We days. did it on yes. Saturday. Yes. We burnt it on Saturday. Yeah. By yesterday, Tuesday. and by yesterday it was it was ash. Can we can we invite you to come and do an experiment? Just come, please. Come, yeah, you. that that is fine. That, but we that, want that, you that to way. test this, Robin. Please, we want you to Take test one against the other. See yeah. what yeah. face them. Just pick up that okay. and hit the, hit the stone. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Okay, so and that's the biggest pieces we can find. Okay. Does that answer your question? Um, somehow. Yes, yeah, yeah, don't you. Use. yeah, but but if you look at that, it's it's you know, that's what it will disintegrate into. And it, I know there are people here who don't believe in um, incineration of their relatives, um, <laughs> but if you do, and when they ask you if you want the ashes, be sure they did it properly. Otherwise, you'll get complete teeth. It's only when the incinerator is hot enough that you get ash. Otherwise, you get your grandmother's teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, at the back there. Yeah. The other lady. Right, yeah. um, there's a lot of talk about the ivory. How does it reflect uh, on the rhino horn? How does it reflect on it? The, the same bun. concept. The, the bun. Well, I think what it was, I mean, Kenya will never sell rhino horn. We don't have enough rhino. We don't believe it should ever be sold any more than we do ivory. My understanding is that there is a movement afoot in Southern Africa, particularly in South Africa, to try and persuade the South African government to legalize domestic trade in ivory that is being um, obtained from private ranches largely in South Africa. Rhino horn. Now, rhino horn can be powdered. You know, nobody's chewing on a rhino horn to get the effect that's been alluded to in some other situations. So if you trade it as powder, isn't that going to open up a floodgate of illicit smuggling of powder? Of course it is. It's, it's more valuable as powder than somebody's done <coughs> grinding. So we want to say, let's not do that. There are not enough rhino left. This is understandable if you're a rancher and you've got rhino instead of cows, you want to get some money for it. The world has gone beyond that stage. And so we are saying, by drawing attention to the destruction of our rhino horn, that we just don't believe that's the way to go. And I actually believe, I've heard, that the South African government has indicated that it will not submit that proposal to CITES at this meeting. So to give them credit, I think they reached that decision without our bullying. But I'm delighted that we are arm in arm on that one issue. Yes. Can you comment on the rhino horn that was burned here that had anthrax and maybe we can scare the world into not ever wanting to buy rhino horn because of that? Well, offering scare tactics to the media is never a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> we did have some rhino that had, had a bovine anthrax. Uh, it had to be handled with care. It was kept in well-sealed, triple-sealed uh, containers. It was burnt in the containers. And I don't think there was ever any risk to people visiting Lake Nakuru, nor has there been to watching the fire. To suggest that Kenya rhino have anthrax is nonsense. We don't have anthrax. And if we did, you're very unlikely to get it from, from that source. So, no, let's keep anthrax in America where it belongs, not here. <laughs> Any quick, urgent question? Because the rain is coming, and that's expensive kit. I'm thinking of myself. <laughs> right, wrap up. And the last one, so we can uh, call it a day. I think there's none.
Shall well, we thank you. Time? Please okay. take your time. Just, you know, put your fingers through the ash, okay. uh, feel it, just, you know, to make sure. We'd like you to just and verify that it's One last burnt. question. We're going to keep the ash. We're going to have a monument behind us where the other one was. And we will figure out what to do with all this ash, whether we distribute it to other countries as a symbol of this event, whether we, we bury it. We're thinking about that. At the moment, it's going to be removed from here. We're going to restore the park to what it was before. We're going to have a monument of ash where the other ones are. We will keep this in, a, in, a, in an appropriate, safe place within the park, but out of view. And in six months or so, we'll announce what we're going to do with it. But we want to restore this area from a bomb site uh, to a, a parkland again. Yeah. Good. Thank you very much. All Thank of you. Thank you. Appreciate it.